Matthew chapter number 5. We're going to continue tonight looking at the next installment in our series of messages concerning reason to believe. And uh, this is our 11th message at this point. And uh, right now we're in the fifth of our uh, logical steps that we're taking, trying to establish the point that we do have reason to believe in the Word of God and the Bible and what it teaches um, and that it has divine authority behind what we read in the Word of God. And uh, the point that we're on right now, as you can see behind me from our steps here, is the fact that Jesus uh, believed in the Old Testament Scriptures. Uh, he recognized and believed in the authority of the Old Testament Scriptures as the Word of God. And uh, we first started seeing that just by some general statements of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and some things that he said about the, the Old Testament uh, collectively. And, of course, in John 10, 35, he said that the Scriptures cannot be broken. And we saw his view of the inerrancy of Scriptures and the fact that uh, he believed and taught his disciples that they should believe all that the prophets have spoken. And uh, he attested to the fact that he recognized the law of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets as being part of the canon of Scripture that was written and that had been penned up to the time in which he spoke those things. And certainly that encompasses the 39 books of the Old Testament as uh, we commonly think of it. He recognized all those books as Scripture and uh, as having divine authority. And then uh, beyond those general statements, we also last week began to get into some various references in the Gospels where... Not only do we see the Lord acknowledging the Old Testament from a general standpoint and through general statements, but there's actually a number of times in which he references specific details that are recorded back there in the Old Testament. He talks about specific individuals, specific events that are recorded as history in the Old Testament. And as we looked at the verses last week, we came to the conclusion that at every single one of those where he talks about, you know, going all the way back to the creation to Adam and Eve and Noah and the flood. He talked about uh, Moses and the children of Israel and their wilderness wanderings. He talked about uh, things that happened with David and Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, Elijah and Elisha and all the prophets. At all those points when he was speaking about those things that you can read about in the Old Testament, every single time he talked about those in terms of those being real people. And those recordings of the Old Testament being real events that really were experienced. Right? He didn't believe that the Old Testament uh, contained uh, what a lot of the scholarship calls mytho-historical accounts. Right? Stories that are back there just to teach a spiritual truth. Right? It's not really real people. It's just a mytho-historical account to convey some spiritual truth. Jesus didn't look at the Old Testament that way. Right? He didn't think about it that way. He looked at it as being historical. Right? He believed and recognized not only the authority of the Old Testament to speak on spiritual matters, but also when it speaks about uh, men and events of history, he recognized that to be the truth just as the Old Testament had recorded it. And he didn't hesitate uh, or draw away from those historical figures of time past as recorded in, in the Old Testament. And so uh, Jesus believed that the Old Testament narratives are in fact historical, and that's a very valuable thing to, to know when it comes to forming your own view on the Old Testament. Right? How should I think about the Old Testament? How, how should I view those things? Well, I would suggest to you that it would be wise to pattern your understanding of the Old Testament after the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If he thinks that the narratives of the Old Testament are historical, then obviously the right way to think is that the Old Testament is, right, those narratives are historical. Right? You, you find your reason to believe the Old Testament just that way from your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, believing it just as he did and recognizing it just as he did. And uh, he, he gives us our reason to believe the scriptures uh, from that, uh, that historical, literal standpoint. Now, there's another aspect to that, I think, that uh, is worth dealing with and considering. And in this message, that's what we want to do. And we're going to look at a few passages similar to the way that we did last week and establish a second sub-point here and look at the fact that not only did Jesus believe that the Old Testament narratives were historical, but also Jesus believed that the Old Testament prophecies are to be literally fulfilled. Right? The Old Testament prophecies are to be literally fulfilled. And again, that, that is another important point, probably just as important as the point we were looking at last week when it comes to uh, forming your own view and your own thinking 
about those scriptures and the things that the Old Testament says are going to take place. Uh, that the, the scriptures talk about it in literal terms. How do we understand that? Well, how did Jesus understand that? And so we want to consider that, and I think that we can uh, see that in several passages and learn some things about the view of the Lord when it comes to the matter of prophecy. And so I've called you to Matthew chapter 5 as our first text of scripture that I want to read to you. And I want to read verses 17 and 18. And I'll tell you here that I'm starting this look tonight in a, a passage in which he's going to make what is a fairly general statement again here at the outset. Now, we're going to look at some specific prophecies as we go along, but here in Matthew 5, we're beginning with a fairly general statement, but one that I think gives us a high-level view, generally speaking, of uh, what he believed about the prophecies of the Old Testament and how that those things uh, would be literally fulfilled. And so if you got your place in Matthew 5, here in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, as he's teaching his disciples there, he says this in Matthew 5, verse 17, he said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot and one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now that's quite a statement from the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? I mean, he's, he's bringing things down to the, the very jot and tittle, right? That these small markings in the, the writing of the scripture, he's, he's, his view on it is not one of those things is going to fall by the wayside until all has been fulfilled. Amen. He had a very high view of the prophets and the writings of the scriptures. And clearly from a statement like that, we know that Jesus did not think nor teach that the words found in the law and the prophets would ever fail by, or fall by the wayside in the outworking of God's program. He saw no scenario in which those things that had been written would not come to pass just as they had been said and just as they had been promised that they would be. He affirmed and maintained the reality of what they testified to. And he presents no scenario in which the promises or the covenants of God to Israel would go unfulfilled. Right? In the mind of the Lord, that, that, that scenario never even existed or came up. He always affirmed the reality that what had been written must be. Right? It must be, and it's all going to be fulfilled. It's not go back and pick and choose and, and you know, decide which ones that you think are reasonable or could probably be. No, he says you believe all of it because every single promise, every single prophecy, down to the smallest jot or tittle, will not pass away, right? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. It'll all be fulfilled. He had confidence in what had been written. And he never taught Israel to expect anything concerning their promises or their covenants to go unfulfilled. He never advocated for an idea like that in his ministry, nor did he ever teach his disciples to expect such things to come. That the word of God would fail. To the contrary, Jesus established and reinforced the law and the prophets at every turn. He affirmed what they had spoken. And he taught his disciples to understand that he was not coming to destroy those things. Right? He, he said it right there in the verse. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. If you got that idea, you've got the wrong idea. I'm not here showing up to do away with all the promises of God that are back there in the Old Testament. He said, rather, I'm coming to fulfill. And we talked about the covenants Sunday. We, we understand in the progression of the program how that there was a purpose through redemption for the new covenant to replace the old. And so there were was, there was some new things, but it was still within the context of the promises that were made to Israel. And he, he constantly affirmed the fact, I'm not here to destroy what was recorded back there in the Old Testament. I'm here to fulfill it all. I'm here to take the necessary steps that make it so that all of those promises of God back there can be made a reality for the nation to whom they've been promised. He always affirmed that. Understand that I am come to fulfill them, he says. Does not our Apostle Paul teach us the same thing about the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ? Romans 15 and verse 8, where he, he talks about the, the ministry of the Lord while on earth. In Romans 15, verse 8, Paul says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. 
Now, who's the circumcision? Israel, right? The Jews. Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. He said, for the truth of God to confirm, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now, to confirm means to establish the truth or the correctness of something. To establish the truth or the correctness of something. To confirm what? The promises that were made unto the fathers. The fathers of the circumcision. He's talking about the covenants and the things that are recorded back there in the Old Testament, right? The promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and the covenants with David and so forth. He says, the ministry of Christ while on earth, he was a minister of the circumcision. He was sent unto his own and his ministry was about confirming those things which God had said before. I'm not come to destroy them. I'm not come to introduce you to this concept that I'm going to replace Israel with a Gentile body. He didn't talk about that. Right? He came as a minister of the circumcision, affirming everything that the Old Testament had said, telling his disciples and teaching them to expect not that God's going to set Israel aside and form a Jew and Gentile, one new man or the church, the body of Christ. That's not what he taught them to expect. He taught them to expect that all of the promises and the covenants of the Old Testament were going to come to pass just as they had been said. Now, he reveals those things concerning the body of Christ later on to the Apostle Paul. The mystery is made known, but it had not been made known during the earthly ministry of the Lord. He came as that minister of the circumcision. And he was affirming everything in the Old Testament concerning Israel's program. There was no scenario in which God the Son taught his disciples to think that that was being set aside and he was going to be doing something else. He's affirming the Old Testament constantly. Confirmation ministry. And he makes quite a bold statement here about that in Matthew chapter 5 when he says that all of it will be fulfilled. Now, when you talk about all those prophecies being fulfilled, how was it in the mind of the Lord that those things would be fulfilled? Right? Because when you talk about fulfilled, what, what does that mean? How is it going to be fulfilled? Is it going to be fulfilled spiritually? Are these figures of things? Uh, you know, is, it, is it terminology back there that's talking about physical or literal terms that's only going to be fulfilled spiritually? Or is he talking about something being fulfilled literally, just like it was stated? Right? How, how did the Lord think about it? Right? He said all would be fulfilled, but how would it be fulfilled? How are we to understand those things? Well, we'll allow the Lord to speak on that. Listen to the words of the Lord. Try to discern the way that he thought about those Old Testament scriptures and prophecies. And try to form a, a pattern of our own thinking on how we should view that. And how we should think about those things. And how they, they will be fulfilled. Now, as I stated a minute ago, I'm going to have you read, or I'm going to read, and have you follow along with me a few passages from the Gospels that try to make this point to you, right? There's some specific prophecies that he'll make reference to. And uh, we're going to look at those in the Gospels, but tonight I'm also going to have you turn back to some of the, the source prophecies in the Old Testament as well, because I think that it's important to be able to see how they describe it in relation to how the Lord Jesus Christ talked about it. And from that, we'll be able to discern how he viewed those things. And so the first one I'll have you go to is right here in Matthew as well. Let's come over to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. I'm going to have you pretty active again with the uh, flipping of pages tonight. And I'll try to go slow enough to give you time to get there. But uh, just by the way on that point that if you don't get all the references down, I do go back and try to put them on the video comments uh, after the service. So if you need to go back to that and find the list. If you don't get them from me after the service, uh, you can get those later as well. And I try to put all the references out there for you. But we're going to start here in Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to look at a prophecy here in which the Lord references something that Daniel said about what he calls the abomination of desolation. Okay? Matthew 24 is a part of what's commonly known as the Olivet Discourse. Okay? And it's known that way because, essentially, if you have a red letter a Bible, especially, you see most of chapter 24 and even into chapter 25 is in red letters. Jesus is speaking here is what that's meant to indicate. And he's giving a discourse, right? And he's doing that 
as he sits upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, right? So naturally, uh, men come to call that the Olivet Discourse. And in this, he's talking about some things. He's answering some questions that the disciples have asked him early here in chapter 4 about the end of the world and the sign of his coming and uh, that type of thing. And so he's, he's getting into these end time matters and so forth in answer to their question. Uh, and uh, he's, he's describing the, the final segment of Israel's program, right? They're, you're coming down to the end of the line on the, the timeline that prophecy has, re has revealed. He's going to go to the cross uh, shortly after this, and he's going to uh, be crucified and rise again and go back to the Father. And then the next thing on the prophetic time schedule would be what we call the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, you may know that as the tribulation period, right? Seven years, seven final years before the... A return of the Lord in glory to the earth and the establishment of the kingdom. And he's describing some things about that final segment of Israel's program here in Matthew 24 and, and 25. And uh, dealing with these, with these end time matters. And here in uh, verse 15, as we're breaking into the middle of what he's saying, he's, he's coming to the midpoint of the seven years here. He's talking about the midpoint or the three and a half year mark which is the middle of the final seven years and some things that are going to be take, taking place and what they're going to see. And that's where he brings up this issue of the abomination of desolation that was spoken of by Daniel. And so we read here, Matthew 24, verse 15. He says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Now, essentially, the message of the Lord here in these verses, he's, he's telling these, these uh, Jewish disciples, these that have believed the gospel of the kingdom and are part of Israel's program, as they're enduring to the end of the tribulation, there's going to come a time there at a certain point, which is the midpoint in those seven years, where they're going to see something that Daniel the prophet spoke about, and when they see that, the commandment of the Lord is for them to get out. Right, get out of Judea, get out of Jerusalem, and you're to flee. Right? You, you, it's, it's an urgent matter when you see what's been spoken of by Daniel the prophet that you get out immediately. If you're on the top of the house, you don't even go back down to get your coat or your clothes and to make preparation. You just get out of there. Get into the wilderness, get into the mountains, go, go get out of there. Right? He's, he's emphasizing the urgency of it at this particular time in the time schedule. It's an urgent matter. And as that marker that indicates the urgency of them getting out of town, he harkens back to something that Daniel said. Right? He references the prophet Daniel. Daniel spoke about what he calls the abomination of desolation. And when they see that, the reason that they are to get out of town is because of what verse 21 there says. What's going to follow prophetically the setting up of the abomination of desolation. Verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Right? The judgment and wrath of God is going to be poured out upon that place. They need to move and get out of there. Now you just take what he's saying there, the way he's giving them this instruction in connection with this, a plain reading from what the Lord is saying do you think it sounds like he thinks Daniel's prophecy is something that is going to be literally fulfilled or not? Sounds like he's pretty serious about it, doesn't it? I mean, if this is just a prophecy that's going to be figuratively fulfilled or spiritually fulfilled, why in the world do they need to leave? If it's just representative of some spiritual truth, why do they need to physically get up and leave? No, his point is, Daniel spoke about some things that you disciples are going to see, you're going to literally see it with physical eyes, and when you see it, you need to physically do something. That's get out. 
Don't just get out in your mind. You've got to literally pick up your body from where you're at in the town and move. Go to the mountains in the wilderness. Literal instruction when they see a literal fulfillment of a prophecy. When you see what Daniel said and what Daniel spoke about, move. And after that's coming great tribulation. That's why you need to get out. Literal judgment. The literal, literal events requiring literal actions on their part. Now come to Luke 21. It's a very similar passage to what we just read, but I wanted to read you this because there's a little different phrase that's used here that I think is important to our point as well. And uh, you can see the significance of the, the terminology, I think, when we read it here. But Luke 21 Verses 20 to 24. Luke 21, beginning in verse 20. He said, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. All right. See the similar instruction there. Get out of town. Verse 22 now. He says, For these be the days of vengeance. Kind of sounds like great tribulation. Right? That's not been since the world to this time. He's describing that here as the days of vengeance. The judgment of God. The wrath of God is going to be poured out. That's why you need to move. And then note the last part of verse 22 there. He says that all things which are written, may be fulfilled. See, that's the whole motivation for them moving themselves from Judea out into the mountains in the wilderness. What has been written is going to be fulfilled. The judgment of God is coming. The days of vengeance are there. Great tribulation follows in connection with Daniel's prophecy. Get out of town! He's talking about those prophecies as having a literal fulfillment. Verse 23, but woe unto them that are with child, unto them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captives into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. He's using literal terminology in his instructions there based upon something that they had been told about in the Old Testament by Daniel. Now, we read the Gospels first and the, the words of the Lord first, but let's go back here and let me just show you the times where Daniel mentions what the Lord's calling the abomination of desolation. There's uh, three places that you can see this uh, similar terminology here in Daniel. And uh, we'll start with Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is a chapter where we get that 70 weeks prophecy that I was alluding to earlier. Right? 70 weeks being determined upon the people and the city of Jerusalem in particular. And uh, if I just kind of put up a timeline here, we're going to the kingdom. You remember uh, back here... There are 70 years in which Israel, or Judah rather, had been captives in Babylon, taken out of the land by Nebuchadnezzar, and they're, they're, the, um, they're out of the land 70 years while the land enjoys their Sabbaths. Okay? And Daniel's prophesying near the end of those 70 years here. Right? Most of that time has been fulfilled. And he comes to understand those 70 years that have been determined upon Jerusalem, as he talks about early in chapter 9 here. And he seeks more understanding about what's left for Israel's program. Okay, And so the angel comes and he gives them this uh, vision and this revelation concerning 70 weeks being determined for the remainder of the program until the kingdom's established for Israel. Okay, And he, he breaks up those 70 weeks or weeks of years into different segments. Okay. So there's a segment of, uh, see if I got a better marker here. 
There we go. All right. Seven weeks, right? And a week is the week of years. So seven years per week. 49 years. That's where they're allowed to go back to the land. They begin rebuilding the temple. Ezra and Nehemiah time frame takes place there. You've got about uh, 400 years here of silence. And this is where you start to get to the Gospels, right, which ends with Messiah being cut off. All right, that period from the end of the seven weeks over to uh, the cross here, that was 62 weeks, which comes out to 434 years. Okay, so you got 400 years of silence, about 34 uh, years there in the Gospels from the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus to the time when Messiah is cut off. And then out here after that, you've got one week, seven years, right? And that's your tribulation period. Daniel's 70th week, final segment. This is what the Lord's talking about in Matthew 24. And he's, he's referring back to what Daniel said and this whole timeline here, okay? So he's outlaying these, these breakdown of the years. You've got seven weeks. 62 weeks, there's 69, and that final one's the 70th, 70th week of Daniel. Okay, so in connection with that, if you look at verse 27, and actually let's let's back up, let's, let's go all the way back to 24, uh, just so you get the verses here of what I've just described. Verse 24, he said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right, so 70 weeks to the fulfillment of God's program with Israel. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore, and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. All right, so you've got the seven weeks there where they're building the wall and the city. 62 weeks from that time till Messiah is cut off at the cross. Okay. Verse 26, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Note verse 27, he says, And he, referring to the prince that shall come, that's Antichrist, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. All right? So you got the one week there. Seven-year covenant that he's making. He says, And in the midst of the week, all right, so the midst, that's your three and a half year point the midst of that week what's going to happen he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease he says and for the overspreading of what abominations he shall make it what yes. desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate all right, so in connection with what the prince that shall come is going to do there at the midpoint, he's going to set up an abomination of desolations, is what the Lord calls it. For the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate. And when he does that, he says there at the end of the verse, that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. What's determined to be poured upon the desolate? Right, the days of vengeance. Great tribulation that has not been seen since the beginning of the world to this time. It's what the Lord was talking about there in Matthew 24. And so that's the first place you can see it in connection with what Daniel spoke at that midpoint and what the Antichrist would do. Uh, you'll see him use uh, abomination of desolation in uh, chapter 11 as well. Verse 31. Daniel 11:31. 31. He says here, uh, speaking of this 
really same subject. He says, an arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. It's the holy place the Lord was talking about. And shall take away the daily sacrifice and they uh, shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. The abomination that maketh desolate. Sounds like the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, right? And then chapter 12, uh, verse 11, he makes the similar statement there, and the phrase is used again. 12, 11, and from that time uh, that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days, right? So he's talking about something that happens there at the midpoint with the Antichrist, profaning the holy place, setting up the abomination of desolation, and that's where the instructions of the Lord in Matthew 24 take hold and where they better obey the commands of the Lord if they don't want to be there when that great tribulation begins to be poured out, right? That determined shall be poured upon the desolate at that point. And you can see that, right? If you look at chapter 12, verse 1, as he's describing all these things in relation to that event, you see 12, 1 of Daniel, he says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince that standeth for the children of thy people, Watch this now. He says, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered everyone that is found written in the book. All right. So in connection with that, you see exactly what the Lord was talking about there in Matthew 24. The judgment of God, great tribulation that had not been seen on that sort uh, up to that time is going to begin to be poured out. Judgment, right? And Daniel talked about all this stuff, right? You got all this prophecy back here. This is Old Testament prophecy when Daniel's speaking about that. And here's the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 21, referring back to the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke about. And he's giving instructions to his disciples on the basis of that, that when you see that literally fulfilled and your eyes can behold it, I'm giving you some little, literal instructions you need to follow to get out of Dodge. Right? He believed that these Old Testament prophecies were going to be literally fulfilled. And the judgment really was coming in connection with the timetable of God. And so the abomination of desolation, uh, the Lord viewed as a literal uh, prophecy that would be literally fulfilled. How about another? Let's uh, talk about how that men will desire rocks to hide them in that judgment. Right? The prophets talked about that. And we'll actually look at the prophet first this time. If you go with me to Hosea. Chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 10, this is a prophecy It's looking ahead to the day of the Lord and the fact that with all that's going on, men are actually going to cry out to be covered by the rocks. And Hosea prophesies this in uh, chapter 10, in verse 8. Hosea chapter 10, verse 8. The prophet says, the high places also of Ivan, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars. And here it is. He says, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Now, when Hosea says that, is he exaggerating? Is he using figurative language just to talk about the fact that they're going to be really scared? Or are they literally going to say that, right? He says that they're going to say to the mountains, cover us and the hills fall on us. Are they really going to say that or not? Well, what does Jesus think? How about Luke 23? Luke 23, 27. This is actually as the Lord is going to be crucified. He says these words and he brings this up. Connection with uh, the people and some women. Uh, lamenting over this issue. Uh, Luke 23, verse 27. All right, it says, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. 
Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? The Lord says that what Hosea prophesied that men would say back there in chapter 10 of Hosea, he says the days are coming in which they shall say that. They're going to say to the mountains fall on us, under the hills cover us. Does he think that's going to be literally fulfilled or not? He does. He talks about it as such. This is coming. These days are coming and men are going to say this. Jesus believed the Old Testament prophecy would be literally fulfilled, doesn't he? How about a third one? How about the prophecies concerning cosmic upheaval in connection with the Lord's return? Back to the prophets. Isaiah 13. And also uh, chapter 34 of Isaiah. Isaiah 13 and 34. We'll read Isaiah 13, 9 through 11 first. Here again, uh, prophecy concerning the day of the Lord's judgment out at the end. And you can see that right off the bat here from verse number 9. Isaiah 13, verse 9. He says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Verse 10, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. All right, so in connection with judgment and uh, the Lord's coming, right? He's going he's gonna to come to punish the world, come to execute judgment, the return of the Lord. In relation to that, he talked there in verse number 10 about the stars of the heavens and the constellations thereof not giving their light. The sun darkens, is darkened in, in his goings forth and the moon not causing light to shine. Sounds like cosmic upheaval, doesn't it? Well, is that just flowery terminology that the prophet's using to bolster his point? Or to convey a message of judgment? Is that just flowery terminology? What does Jesus think? Well, let's, re let's read 34 first. I forgot I told you I was going to read some verses there. Before you go to the Gospels, let's go to uh, Isaiah 34. It actually talks about this again. Isaiah 34, verse 1. Here he says, Come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. Right? The days of vengeance, we might say. The indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury is upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. Verse 4, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, and the, as the leaf falleth off of the vine, and as the falling fig from the fig tree. Here again, he's talking about the host of heaven being dissolved, and the heavens being rolled together as a scroll. Cosmic upheaval that the prophet is describing in connection with the coming of the Lord. Now, uh, let's go to Mark 13. Mark chapter 13. And these similar verses could also be read in uh, Matthew 24, 29 to 34 as well. But uh, we've been in Matthew 24 already, so we'll read Mark 13. Verses 24 to 26. Mark 13, beginning at verse 24. The Lord speaking here again. He says, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be what? Darkened. And the moon shall not what? Give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken 
And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of the heaven. So in connection with the words of the Lord, as he's talking about his own returning glory, he says that when he comes and when they see the Son of Man coming, you're going to have the sun darkened, the host not giving their light, the moon is hiding her light from the earth. He talks about those prophecies in literal terms, doesn't he? That's the way it's going to be when the Son of Man comes. When he comes to execute judgment and to tread the, the fierceness and winepress of the wrath of Almighty God, it's coming and there's going to be cosmic upheaval in connection with this coming. Because that's the way it's going to be. He believed the Old Testament prophecies would be literally, literally fulfilled. Cosmic upheaval in connection with his return. And then one final one, we'll look at the fact that there's going to be feasting in the kingdom. All right, a little more positive no we looked at judgment tonight but uh, we'll look at feasting in the kingdom isaiah 25 isaiah 25 we're interested in verses 6 through 8 here and he's describing the triumphs of the kingdom and the glory of the lord here in chapter 25 in relation to the kingdom. And so we're picking up a few verses in the midst of all that. Kingdom glory. Isaiah 25 verse 6. He says, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. A feast of wines on the lees. Of fat things full of morrow. Of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people. And the veil that is spread over all nations. He shall swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. Right, God talks about a, a feasting. That's going to be going on there in the kingdom. And then if you come over to Matthew chapter 8. We see a brief reference to this from the Lord. How that those of the nations will indeed come to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. I'm in Mark, so I better get to the right place. Or I'll confuse you thoroughly, won't I? Matthew chapter 8. All right. Let's go ahead and back up. That, that's the verse we want, but I want you to see the flow here because uh, I think it'll make a little more sense if we read the context. Back up to verse 5 here the, where this account starts. Matthew 8, 5, he says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Verse 11 now, he says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west, right, those nations, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so we see the Lord making reference to the fact of something that was prophesied back there by Isaiah, the feasting of the Lord, and how that God would make this feast unto all nations, and that they would come and enjoy these things when the kingdom is established. And here's the Lord Jesus Christ saying that there's many going to come from the east and from the west, and they will sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and that prophecy spoken by Isaiah will be literally fulfilled in the kingdom. You start looking at these specific examples where the Lord makes reference to prophecies, whether of judgment, in the cursing, or even in the blessing of the kingdom. At every point when the Lord talks about Old Testament scripture and the prophecy thereof, he talks about it in terms of the fact, believing that it's going to be literally fulfilled. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Every jot, every tittle, he said, will be fulfilled. He's going to make sure of it. That's part of his glory. When he's, he's spoken these things ahead of time, exactly what he's going to do. And he comes and he works out his plan in time where his wisdom, his manifold wisdom is worked out. And at every point where he said it'll be, it is and it is and it is. And men are looking at that. And they're saying that he has, he has done every single thing he ever said that he would do. He declared his plan at the beginning before he ever did it. And what he said would be, he has accomplished. That's why they can say in Revelation, thou art worthy Amen. of blessing and honor and glory and power. You alone are worthy. He's faithful and true Amen. to his word. And he's going to see to it that every last thing that has been spoken and that has been written in those prophecies is brought to pass just like he said. I don't know if you noticed in the verses that we read in Psalm 22 toward the end of that chapter. He's talking about his works being de declared to a generation that shall be born that he hath done this. He hath done this. It's part of his glory. And the glory that he's purposed for his son and the glory for the Godhead as a whole, ultimately, rests in the fact that he will fulfill his word just as he said. You know, he said in the Psalms, I believe it is, that thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And we've talked about it. We know how glorious that name is. What that name represents. His grace, yes, that's wonderful. All the things that he's brought to pass has been done in grace. But when it's all done, it also magnifies his truth. Yeah. He's accomplished it, just as he said. So we see that Jesus believed and recognized the authority of the Old Testament scriptures. Never cast doubt on it, never questioned it. He believed it generally, all of it should be believed. But then on very specific points, he believed that the Old Testament narratives are historical, literal people, literal events, just as the Old Testament records it about the past and also what the Old Testament says about the future. The prophecies, he believed, would be literally fulfilled. Jesus believed and recognized the Old Testament scriptures as the authoritative word of God. So knowing that, what might you think your view of the Old Testament ought to be? I'd suggest that you ought to recognize it as the authoritative word of God. That the narratives are historical and that the prophecies will be literally fulfilled. Why? Because Jesus did. How do I know Jesus said those things? Because the Gospels are reliable. Accounts of what he said and did. Knowing that he said those things, why should I believe that those are true? Because he's been validated in the fact that God the Father raised him from the dead and set his seal on the truthfulness of everything he tested to, attested to. He forms our reason to believe those Old Testament scriptures. And hopefully those few points help uh, in establishing the fact that we're not just sticking our head in the sand, not just religious nuts. We've got solid and sound, logical reasons to believe. The Old Testament as the Word of God. Amen. 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 Thank you for listening tonight. We'll go on from there next week. Our God and Father, we're grateful for the time you've given us tonight. We pray that these various verses and passages shared with the, the saints tonight would be for their edification, the strengthening of their confidence in your Word, and Lord, the, their, their ultimately their growth in godliness and uh, their ability to... Um, just uh, submit to that word and to ultimately glorify you with their lives. We thank you for this place. Thank you for the, uh, the word of God that is held up here. And Lord, we uh, thank you for the, the privilege of having a copy of it in our own language that we can read and understand and study. And thank you for the privilege to labor together uh, in, in the word and in the doctrine and edifying one another. We just pray, Father, for the remainder of this week that we continue to walk in your word. And looking forward to uh, coming Sunday where we can meet together again. We give you all the thanks and praise for what's accomplished, for it's in your name we ask it. Amen.